All right. Well, it was fun while it lasted. You know, Caleb Williams, the number one overall pick. Bears get to get to enjoy uh, and and you know just soak up all the glory because Mark, I, I got to read this headline to you. Chicago Bears Caleb Williams had awful practice, completed just three <laughs> passes in a drill. So it's over. It's over. I, clearly. I saw, clearly, it's uh. I it's saw all, that. Did you on. read? We actually got to read more than the headline. Both no, I know, Roma I know. Dunze and uh, Keenan Allen were not available for that particular seven on seven drill. That may have a little something to do with it, but clearly this is showing us that Caleb Williams is just not an NFL court. Yeah. Right. I do love yeah. how DJ Moore came out after that press conference. It did say, Hey, like duh, growing pains. Like, yeah, you got to, like, this is everyone has like, bad practices, but it's, it's this funny. is like, I mean, most, most people are t- joking about how I, I think there was that CBS broadcast where one, where the guy was saying, all right, this just in, you know, your favorite rookie player actually stinks uh, on the first, after the first day of practice and so-and-so uh, got an injury and all this stuff. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously people make a lot uh, out of OTAs then and make too big of a deal out of it. Most have, uh, of the media now is, you know, caught up to, to making light of this whole thing, but there are still a lot of fans out there that just blow this stuff way out of proportion and it's kind of crazy. I say it, I think every year we've done the show, but I'll say it again. It's a good time to reiterate it. As we head into OTAs in this in this training camp world, like the most, it, the thing that you should get the most riled up about as a fan, it, like is an actual injury. That is something you should always keep an eye out for. Is there an actual injury? And then is there an actual position battle for like a starter, all right? Like, is there a veteran guy who your team signed and maybe paid big money to brought in and you're like, all of a sudden, it's like, man, is your, you know, is your one or two team reporters you trust saying like, dude, the, the ro- that undrafted rookie is pushing this guy. Yeah, and like, yeah. it, like yeah. those are to me the interesting things. All the other stuff about so-and-so threw a bad interception or so-and-so fumbled the ball three times or so-and-so is a little overweight or whatever it might be or so-and-so Lamar Jackson, the best shape of their life. He lost weight. Like, all of that is is oh, what we like to call over coverage. There's too many reporters. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. They've got deadlines. They've got stories to write. They've got clicks to get. So focus on injuries and then legitimate position battles. Those things are going to matter for your team when it actually comes into playing the games uh, in September. Yeah, and it's one of those things, too, where, I mean, we're all just hungry for football. So yeah. a lot of times we just want to talk about it. <laughs> um, and, and so that's, you know, it's true. It's part of what makes football so great is that people are having narratives forming this early on. Uh, and it's another thing that kind of, you know, makes you scratch your head sometimes too, but we'll take it overall. We have something on the show to discuss every week here, uh, you know, 52 weeks out of the year, give or take. And so, uh, no complaints here, by the way, we're getting ready for our, uh, fifth season, uh, uh, of coverage show, you can, or fourth season on the show i should say of coverage because wow. we did 2020 21 22 23 no fifth this will be our fifth uh a- nfl football season that we we'll started during the, the covid year that was the first we one did. we decided to that cover was it you know that God, was we brave that was, yeah aren't we yeah, brave that, we we and about you know 1.6 million other americans decided this is the perfect time to start doing a podcast we're we're pent up in our own homes we're so brave we're after it we're we so really brave. Are. you know <laughs> but, just, everyone's uh, got to be not everyone can be a pioneer exactly well we're happy to be back here on the show uh after yet another uh you know brief break uh talking obviously the nfl schedule has been released since we last spoke so we're going to get into that talk bears steelers Overall NFL schedule, some tidbits that we pulled from that as well, and a couple news and notes, of course, uh, as we enter this uh, pivotal moment with OTAs uh, and training camp then coming up uh, in just a little bit. But let's get to it. The NFL schedule reaction. All right, soon enough, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll get to find out what emoji we uh, <laughs> best relate to when it comes to our team's schedule, yeah. the Bears and the Steelers, uh, and the overall schedule, of course, as well. A couple minor notes I want to get to, Mark, before we dive into this thing. Antonio Brown, filing for bankruptcy. And I actually think the 
uh, narrative a- around this has been really good. It's been a lot of people actually saying, like having the discussion about, you know, him as a person and whether or not he's okay, because um, obviously there's not going to be many tears shed for this guy, given yeah. all the stuff that's happened and the things that he has, some terrible things that he's done to other people and out in the public eye. Um, but, you know, there have been some serious conversations about once again, looking back on that Vontez perfect hit that seemed to change everything with Antonio Brown, all of the stuff started to cascade from there. And, uh, I know he's making light of CTE. He's got his CTE SPN thing that he's trying to lift off the ground, but unfortunately Mark, uh, and you never say never in this day and age, but this guy just seems like there are not very really going to be many opportunities for him to recoup much of anything because he has tried to do his, you know, rap career and tried to do all of these other things that haven't fully panned out. Now he files for bankruptcy. It's just been a, a spiral for like six, seven years. It seems like. Yeah. It's another sports, you know, I mean, he's been a sports tragedy for a long time. This was like the next thing you're waiting for. Like, Oh, yeah. okay. The cop showing up to the house, the, the pool video with his dong out, the, you know, all the stuff, yeah, leave the way he left furniture the, off a balcony the, and injuring yeah. a child. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, okay. And now he files for bankruptcy. So there you go. There bingo. Like the bingo card is complete. Yeah. I mean, good luck to him and the people he owes money to, cause you're probably not getting it. And what he's, you know, this, the only thing that you do feel like feel for him in, and the people around him is like, he's not an old guy. Like he's got his whole life still ahead of him. And it's a great, great warning to these NFL players. You know, when the money's coming in, the money's good. But when that, when you stop getting those weekly checks and now it's like, Hey, you, you have only what's left in your bank account to live off of for the rest of your life. If you haven't invested smartly or you haven't, you know, put money away uh, or you don't have another career you're about to jump into, whether it's an analyst or media or whatever, yeah, like you can be not even 40 years old and you can be completely broke and bankrupt. And uh, it's, I think I, at one point in time, I think I read that he had made 80 million in his career. 80 million. Yeah. And um, that goes quick. Obviously there's taxes. That's like, that's just like the gross, right? Versus sure. the, so, we'll so say 35 like, to 40. You know what I mean? But at some yeah. point in time, yeah, there, it, it probably brought in, you know, after you pay your agents, everything, you know, m- you know, closer to, you know, probably $40 million and where'd all that go? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's gone and he's got not, you're right. Not much prospects ahead of him. We'll see. Yeah. I, I, I don't really shed a tear. I, I'm like, no. you, you start with that story and I was literally coughed guard. I was like, Oh, I didn't think this would be news I, worth, <laughs> worth touching on, but it is, yeah, it is yeah. sad. I mean, you do, feel, but like, he's such a jerk and such a, uh, you know, well, and yeah, I don't he, want to he go- doesn't garner much sympathy. It's yeah. more, I think it just lends credence to the overall discussion of like, uh, you know, man, like some people really need help out there. And, yeah. uh, and he's been a guy that we've seen signs. It, it's kind of like the Kanye conversation. It's like, yeah, well, Kanye's yeah, yeah. made, you know, so, so much money, but it's like, man, we're watching people in real time kind of you know just deteriorate and go Fall off the wall and it's like shoot you know it's uh that, it is watching a train like a wreck and there's nothing you could do there's right, nothing you could right. do right yeah yeah so it's just one of those warding sides but um i digress i mean speaking of pittsburgh a former pittsburgh Steeler and antonio brown pittsburgh won its bid to host the uh 26 yeah. nfl Love draft that. so that's pretty cool it is interesting that the nfl draft now for several years in a row it's going to be held in very like blue blood cold weather city it's going to be probably pretty chilly next year in green bay of course it's probably yeah. you know in april still going to be you know snowing and then uh you know <laughs> pittsburgh going to be pretty chilly too but that is kind of cool they're getting back to their roots and yeah i mean i i heard i, I don't remember who uh said it i think matt williamson who covers the steelers is like the nfl you know of course we we bang this gavel uh all the time is so good at marketing and so great at you know, finding out how to appeal to their fan bases. And this is just another iteration of like, okay, they've done the big flashy stuff. They've gotten the Super Bowl in LA. They've had this like, you know, new stadium in Las Vegas. They've built and expanded. They've got the Taylor Swift stuff. And at the same time, catering to their base, catering to the the blue blood franchise of the NFL here with the NFL draft, where they know they're going to get hundreds yeah. of thousands, if not millions of, of Steelers fans, of Lions fans, of Packers fans attending 
and making this the spectacle that it is. So, you know, in- incredible stuff, and it should be a good time. Like we said, Detroit showed up and showed out. They set a record, yeah. and I'm sure the people of Green Bay are going to try to break that next year. They're they're going to literally have to bring people in from not their town because more people were at the Lions oh, yeah. uh, thing than I think live in the city of Green Bay. So they're going to need those Packer fans and, and people to show up and go to the draft. And uh, and I'm happy for Pittsburgh. I think it's a cool thing that it goes down the road. I think they're now it's a well-oiled machine, so just keep it rolling. And you're right. It is a really nice dichotomy the NFL has found uh, where they're able to do things on this grandiose scale uh, for their high-end clientele and then also say, hey, we're going to Detroit. And next right, year, we're going yeah. to Green Bay. The year after that, we're going to Pittsburgh. And so you fully expect them to be in Baltimore like the next year. You know what I mean? Or, right. or, yeah. uh, or, 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 you know, you trying know, to think of another. Like Cincinnati or. Uh, They've already been to uh, Kansas you know, City. Maybe- you know, didn't they already do yeah. it in? Uh, didn't they already do it in Philly too? Was it in Philly or no? Not yet. Was it? Yeah, uh, I think it was. I thought it was in Philly, Philly I, after in Chicago, Chicago obviously. and then Philly. Um, yeah, I think it was no, Chicago, Philly, sense. then Nashville. You know, so no, it's exciting. I, I'm happy for Pittsburgh. That'll be awesome. I am curious about the infrastructure situation, primarily with Green Bay, because like, how are they going to get that many people? How many roads are there? Like, I mean, well, there's, there's not, not enough hotels. I mean, there's yeah, yeah, I can definitely tell you not enough right hotels, now. and they're going to use fields probably. So many fields for parking, I would imagine. Just yeah. corn, just drive into the corn. Well, and, you uh, have to parking. do it at Lambo. There's nowhere else in Green Bay to even do yeah. it. Like, there's not even like a a sick theater. I think there is like a minor league, um, like a minor league NHL team in Green Bay that has like a, oh, a, a stadium, like an ECHL a fairly new something. stadium yeah. near, near Lambo and like the big brewery they have up there, title town brewery. Like there is some newer things, but even then, I don't know if that's where you're going to hold it. Like to try to get in like record break. It's just going to have to be in Lambo. It's going to be like fill up Lambo and then fill yeah. up the, the, and they're going to build the stage in one of the end zones, you know? So what if Pittsburgh will do? Pittsburgh will have something and they'll, they'll show out for sure. Yeah, yeah. Pittsburgh's got a lot of hills and winding roads, so that that'll be tough too. But they've got, you know, they're the city of bridges. They have like, you know, eighty. They should just hold it on like a that. bridge. Yeah, yes. Make the yeah. draft picks walk Shut across down a bridge. A bridge. It, it, that'd be pretty sweet, man. It'd Imagine hilarious. Mac Jones making the draft walk down the bridge. You know, <laughs> yeah. Watch yeah. out for those uh, those cracks in the foundation. For sure. Exactly right. Um. All right. Let's get into the schedule. Uh, a pretty cool time of year where we get to react to. Uh, you know, our teams uh, to schedule how things pan out and uh, look at some of the primetime games. That's always fun and and, and kind of dissect things. So I'll cue up the Bears. Uh, if you're watching, this is probably a good episode to watch. We'll be kind of yeah. sharing the schedule on the screen, but we'll walk through it for those listening as well. So uh, adding this up here, pulling up the Bears schedule and, uh, you know, pretty solid, you know, entrance into the year, I'd say. Uh, not terribly difficult, but not the easiest. Uh, you know, thing either. Um, I will say defensively, it's pretty, I, I like my initial reaction was, okay, Caleb Williams will, will not, will be getting some help to start the year in terms of the defenses he's facing. The Titans aren't terribly scary. Texans are good. They've got a good coordinator, but there's not, you know, it, outside of Will Anderson, there's nobody where you're like, oh my gosh, terrified of the Colts kind of the same thing. They're, they're decent and solid. Rams are, you know, a, a kind of a ragtag group, although they played pretty well last year, then Panthers and and Jacksonville. So really up until the bye, I'm not overly concerned about Caleb Williams being under just this immense pressure. And so that was my initial thought. At the same time, they're going to have to score points because they are playing some decent offenses in this grouping here. And, uh, you know, they're not, they, they can't just take it lightly and expect to win 10 to seven either. So that was my initial thought. Now, how about you? My initial thought was, thank God it's not Sunday night football week one against Green Bay, like in Green Bay. Like, thank, yeah, I can't yeah. handle that. Because instantly it's the pressure again. of up, Caleb, you, yeah. if you lose this one, then you're setting the precedent for losing to the Green Bay Packers for the rest of your career. I mean, that was the Bears last season. You start with Green Bay, you ended with Green Bay, and it would just, it, it, it was depressing. I mean, it, that loss. Did Fields just, I mean, start it, his career uh, against, was his first start against Green no, Bay? No, remember, he had, he had to go in for Andy Dalton against the Browns, like, it, like, halfway through the first quarter because Andy Dalton yeah, yeah. like pulled his hammy or whatever running out of bounds. And then I don't remember who his, his actual first start was against after yeah, that. It wasn't Green Bay though. Um, my So that was my initial thought. And then my thought was, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is really, really workable. 
like really workable. So if you want, I can kind of go through it and kind of talk yeah, through absolutely. my initial, my mission, uh, my initial thought was so like, I love starting off with Tennessee at home again, Tennessee new head coach. They're going all offense and uh, they you knew, bring in, you know, Joe Burrow's coordinator, offensive coordinator in Cincinnati, Callahan. And so this is a young team with very low expectations in Tennessee that uh, has a young quarterback. And so Caleb gets to be at home against a very, very uh, weak defense to start at a noon game, no pressure, the primetime slot. I love that. I, I think I think that's a, it's a great start. Then you go on the road to, to the Texans, which it's a very, it's going to be a very like a litmus test type of game, right? You expect to get off to a 1-0 start against Tennessee at home. You go on the road against the Texans, and that is Sunday night football. So they're saying, hey, yep. we give you a week. Now week two, we're going to put the number one pick on the primetime, get that Bears viewership, Houston, fourth largest TV market in the country beyond after Chicago, New York, and LA. And so it's like, all right, this should be a big time primetime game. Upstart Houston. I don't expect the bears to beat Houston in Houston, but what that litmus test will be is, Hey, can this offense score and be competitive with what we saw last year with, by the end of the year, one of the most explosive quarterbacks and offenses in the NFL. So you go all right, week two, but through week two, I have them kind of at one and one. That game then against Indianapolis becomes really important and really unique. We just don't know as of right now what to expect out of Indianapolis because we didn't see Richardson at all. And they did they got rid of Gardner Minshew. So it's not even like, oh, well, we know at least if Gardner Minshew's playing, depending on what Richardson's health is, if you expect him to start the year or whatever, you at least know what you got with them when they had Gardner. You just don't know what you're getting with Shane Steichen and this Indianapolis Colts team. You expect them to be explosive. You expect them to be a team that's going to come out and be really creatively, creative offensively. But again, on the defensive side of the ball, as you said, nothing that scares me on the road. I expect the Bears to get a win there. I have them at two and one through three games. You come home and they got a real test, a real test at home against the Rams team. This is a season up to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Real bummer for the Bears that they get the Rams at home in early part of the year in September. You'd love to have seen that game in December or January feel like you get a, a weather advantage. And so I expect that to be a loss. Uh, I mean, it's Sean McVay, better coach, better quarterback, and uh, a team that was in the playoffs last year. I expect the Rams to beat the Bears at home. Bears are two and two through four. Then this is where it gets really exciting. You can beat up and destroy the Panthers at home. There's no reason why they shouldn't destroy the Panthers. They blow out the Panthers at home. You're is three and two. Boost? Yeah, you're three and two. You go to London for a really tough game against the Jaguars. I expect them to lose against the Jaguars in London. Again, travel, uh, coach, quarterback, L the Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence. Now, this is his fourth year of going to London. Like, this is old hat for them. Yeah. And so the one advantage they do have is that they're both going to be, if they leave for London at the same time, they'll both have the similar rest. It's not like, because the Jaguars are going to play back-to-back -back games in London. So it sucks for the Patriots who play the Jags in London the next week. Because the Jags will already be you know, acclimated to the time change and all that. They have a huge advantage over the Patriots in that second week. So maybe the Bears could catch them sleeping. But I expect them to lose to the Jags. I have the Bears at a reasonable 3-3 three and three into the bye week. Absolutely. Now, could that be 2-4? and four? Could it be 4-2? and two? I, Yeah, but I think I'm being fairly conservative in saying a win at home against Tennessee, a win at home against Carolina, a win on the road against Indianapolis – and then three tough losses against two playoff teams last year and a team with a with a with a uh, a coach and a quarterback who are kind of on a must win type of year and they're on the road again in a foreign country against a team that that they that has been there before. I think it's reasonable to say three and three. And yep. now you start to say if you're a Bears fan, this is where the crucial part of the season is. You have an early buy. I don't love the early buy traditionally, but in this case, yeah. I think it it works in our favor. After You're three London. and three. Yeah, you reset and you say to your young quarterback, hey, how's it been going? Let's take let's take stock in what's going on. You get some guys healthy. You're going to have some injuries, right? And then you have five winnable games. I think the Bears go on a five-game win streak here. I really do. At Washington, at Arizona, those are must-wins. When you circle them at the beginning of the season, Agreed. those are must-wins. It's a must-win yeah. just like the Panthers and the Titans. So through those games we talked about so far, I think there's four must wins. Tennessee, Carolina, Washington, Arizona. You're better than all four of those teams roster-wise. Your coach is just as good as all those coaches coaching-wise. 
your quarterback is just as good or better than all those quarterbacks quarterbacking wise. So you have a roster advantage and a coach and a quarterback neutral or slightly better leaning. You've got to win those four games. Then you have the Patriots at home. That is a must win. So you have three must win games in a row. Cause again, you have a quarterback advantage, you have a coach equal or advantage, and you have a massive roster advantage. So there's a three game win streak after the bye. I have the Bears at six and three, and then home against Green Bay. Is it crazy for me to say the Bears can then beat Green Bay at home when they're already on a three game win streak, flying high, rolling in hot? I don't think it's crazy for me to say they split the season series with the Packers. They win their home game, especially if they're on a three game win streak. Bears go on a four game win streak. Then the um, Vikings come to town, and the Vikings come to town when you haven't left town in three weeks, and you're on a four-game win streak. I think the Bears win it going a five-game win streak. They beat the Vikings here. All of a sudden, you're at eight and three. If you can make that happen, and now you could still be eight and three if you went four and two pre-buy, right? And then you didn't go on a five-game win streak, but you went four and one in this stretch against Washington, Arizona, New England, uh, Green Bay, and Minnesota. So either way, I think eight and three is really plausible where then you say to yourself, I only got to win two more games the rest of the year to make the playoffs and feel good, right? So where are those wins coming from? In my opinion, they're coming from at Minnesota and on the road against Seattle. So I have the Bears as a 10-win team. I think the 10 wins that they that are easy for me to predict in the schedule are those 10. Tennessee, uh, 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 Indianapolis, Carolina, Washington, Arizona, New England, Green Bay at home, Minnesota, Minnesota, Seattle. If those are the 10 I feel like are, that's the way they get to 10 wins. You're not telling me that maybe they could find a way to split the season series with Detroit. Maybe it's possible. Uh, so there could be 11, but I think if you're predicting any more than 11 wins, I think you're going way too over your skis with this Bears team. I love this Bears team. I got a ton of confidence, but I think that window is really, I don't see them winning less than nine. I don't see them winning more than 11. I'll split the difference and go 10. And then probably yeah. something will go different, right? They'll lose to Tennessee, but they'll beat Houston, right? So something will go different in that in that world because of that's just how it works. But I think 10 wins is extremely plausible. The thing that concerns me is you go in that, you had that big win streak that I'm predicting. Say they win five in a row or even four out of five in that streak after the bye. It could really come crashing down to earth at Detroit for Thanksgiving and then at San Francisco. Those are yeah. two teams that are way up, up, a huge level up in class, in roster, in coaching, in quarterback play. And so that's concerning. Like, right, you just don't want to. You don't want to get totally embarrassed. I would love to see them go on a five-game win streak and be eight and three, but lose a tough game on the road on Thanksgiving to 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 Detroit, and then play a really close game and maybe McCaffrey breaks one loose at the very end of the game for the Niners to kick a field goal and beat you. It's how they lose those two games against Detroit and San Francisco after. Uh, Thanksgiving in the day, the week after Thanksgiving, that to me will say if this Bears team will have a chance to actually win something in the playoffs or not. I think they get in with 10 wins, but how they compete against Detroit on Thanksgiving and San Francisco after Thanksgiving will tell me, can they, and again, this is all if health, you know, no giant health issues, can they actually compete in the playoffs? Crucial for them to sweep Minnesota. They're better than Minnesota roster-wise. They have a better quarterback than Minnesota, no matter who Minnesota starts. And they have a massive deficit of coaching against Minnesota, but I think their roster versus Minnesota's roster, especially on the defensive side of the especially ball, defense, yeah. makes yeah. up for that coaching era, error. And the Bears get the Vikings later in the season. So by the time the Bears play the Vikings again, if all health is considered – I, I will fully believe more in my quarterback and my coach and my coaching staff to handle my quarterback versus Minnesota and their quarterback. Uh, so that's that's my thoughts. I do think they split with Green Bay. I'll say they win at home, lose on the road week 17. That'll be a tough one because most likely Green Bay and the Bears will be vying for playoff positioning. That could even be the difference between being like the four seed and the six or seven seed in the wild card that last week of, of the season. So 
that'll be a really nerve wracking game. But I'll give Green Bay. I think Green Bay's roster is great. Their quarterback played great at the end of the year. Great head coach. So I'll give the, I'll give them a split, and 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 be as honest as I can about that. But that is my official thoughts and predictions. We don't know what these teams will look like after week three or four. Injuries will start to pile up. You just don't know. But if you go go on paper, paper says anything less than nine wins would be a real disappointment for this team, the way this schedule is shaped and who's on their schedule. Yeah. I, I, I also agree that the most pivotal stretch of this season isn't the final six, but the five after the bye. I agree yeah. because that's that's really going to shape a lot of things for them because if they if they somehow go two and three during that stretch oh. high, then they're staring down a gauntlet of immense pressure yeah. and like then all of a sudden those two home games are must wins and then also that road game against minnesota and probably that final game against green bay because yeah. must wins as well yeah. and then you're just setting yourself up for a disaster the only thing that does worry me is those three road games in a row, even though it's sandwiched with the bye, which helps. And personally, I'd rather my team get a road game out of the way after a bye versus having a home game after a bye, only because I, I like my home game advantages. I, I don't need the double advantage of the bye and home. Like yeah. I'd rather get, you know, two mini advantages throughout the year versus one bigger one. That's a great way to um, think about it. So I, I do like that part, but the Washington Cardinals thing does scream kind of trap game w- worry issue, especially the Cardinals one, because, you know, Kyler Murray and company did start to gain some steam towards the end of last season. And now with Kyler Murray, a completely full, healthy off season, we can see the full iteration yeah. of what Jonathan Gannon's team is supposed to look like. And they've got Marvin Harrison Jr. Who will be seven games into his rookie campaign at this point. Like, that could be a, a situation where Caleb, we're going to have to get into some sort of shootout here, and that could be a problem too. Um, yeah. But overall, I agree. I think I probably uh, would have predicted them at about 10 wins uh, this upcoming season too, which should be in the NFC good enough to get them a wild card berth uh, in, the, in the playoffs. And so, and even if they don't make the playoffs, a 10 win season, you'll Shoot. take oh, that my God. for Caleb's first year. Yeah, but he'd be huge. Yeah, yeah, especially if he can toss 26 touchdowns and, you know, 3,800 yards or get close to, like, either of those two Bears records and and just look competent and good, stay healthy, uh, that's a big win for the the Bears. Yeah, I do agree with you. The bye is really tricky because it's like leave for London, come home. you got to get reacclimated on your bye, and then you. it's a really surprisingly important – game that'll actually have a lot of emotion against Washington because right, of the yeah, one versus two DC and yeah, it's, and he'll have, a, you know, be all the ticket, you know, sales and all that. And it's one versus two. That's going to be a very big, you know, already both those guys have circled that game on the schedule sure. just as they circled. I'm sure Caleb is hoping that Drake may starting for new England by the time they play them as well, circle that on the schedule. And then Kyler Murray is the guy that Caleb, you know, it's like, well, he's compared most to Kyler Murray and Patrick Mahomes. So that is a you know what again, a weird that's a it's a it's a weird stretch where it's like, I know my team has a better roster than those three teams, but there's a lot of weird, interesting storylines that could kind of cloud up that get those games. So on paper, I'm looking at that as those are three must win games. But if you're a Washington fan or an Arizona fan, you're looking at the at the Bears coming to town and going. That's a must win game as well. Like exactly. they see, it, so it's you got to flip. You got to flip it in there as well. Um, that's why I do think it's crucial to at least be three and three going into the bye. Would I kill for them to somehow be four and two or better? Yeah, because if they're four and two or better, then it's Margin less pressure. It's less pressure bit. to go five and zero oh in that stretch. You could go four and one and have a mistake somewhere. Someone has to miss a game for a hamstring or whatever, and you're just not the same. Um, but if you are, say, let's say four and two, and you find yourself maybe you upset Jacksonville somehow, and you are four and two, then you open up the gates. If you can go five and zero, oh, all of a sudden you're nine and two, and then there is that weird pressure of like, uh, man, this could be could this be the number one overall seed? And yet then you have this gauntlet of of Detroit twice 
and San Francisco in four out of uh, three out of four games in a row. Like that is a tough, tough stretch. And it's probably um, similar. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish that thought. No, it just it like so. It, it, there's a lot of um, again. It doesn't matter. Does any of this matter? No, because by week one, knock on wood. But so and so, I'm not going to say a name. But so and so could tear an ACL. An important player on an offense, defense doesn't matter for any team. And this all goes out the window, like Aaron Rodgers last year. But this is why one of the reasons why we love football is because this is digestible for us to predict and talk about when the 162 game MLB season comes out. No one in their right god awful mind sits there and goes game by game game and tries to predict winners. You can't yeah. do it. You don't know rotations. Yeah. You, you go don't by know. months, basically. Yeah. Like, can we go, you know, 15 and five, uh, you know. In yeah, yeah. Can we win like these yeah. five series in a row right? or whatever it might be? So yeah. that's what this what makes football special. So I know this is a silly exercise, but it's a fun one. And I can't wait for you to do it now with the Steelers and, and uh, the, your Steelers. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Talk about a, a really tough oh, second half stretch. Terrifying. You think the Bears <laughs> three out of four games is tough. The Steelers, it's like backloaded yeah. completely. Yeah. yeah, I mean the the Bears' final six games is a really tough stretch. I like looking at on paper because like even though the Vikings aren't that great, they're still a division opponent, and you're yes. like, well, you know, shoot, that's tough. And and it's on Seattle the road. is not among the worst teams in the league. Uh, they're they're not great, but they're they're a middling team, and they're they're scrappy, and they can they could pull off a win. You know, you that wouldn't be shocking to anybody. So that's a tough stretch of games. Uh, especially, you know, the the one the one non division game being uh, San Fran, and the fact that the Bears' first uh, division game comes in Week Eleven. Uh, so does the Steelers. Yeah. So it's backloaded. That's, uh, that's that's very crazy. And it, it, just to drive home the point real quick, and how even a two game stretch can completely change the course of a season. This exact two back to back games here with the Cardinals and Patriots for your Bears. Where that was the two game stretch last year for the Pittsburgh Steelers that they completely unraveled, fell apart, and uh, and and lost uh, you know to the the three win Patriots at the time, uh, just an absolutely atrocious loss that uh, that put them on a three game losing streak against all teams they should have won, and yep. uh, and and you were you were fighting and clawing at the at the very end of the season to to even make the playoffs and they didn't get it done or they they barely got it done and. Uh, and, and and you know the the rest is history. But so I'll transition to the, the to the Steelers uh, schedule here as well. And you know maybe, maybe I'll be able to kind of broaden this a little bit here. Make it nah, I'm not going to be able to. But ho- hopefully you can all see it. Um, it's the best one I got to uh, to showcase at the time. But yeah, the first several games, uh, you know, going into the bye, uh, I feel you know fine and 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 decent about. Uh, the bye week coming in week nine is one of the best bye week placements that I've Agreed. seen for the Steelers in recent years. And so that's really nice. I would love it to, I always like it to be smack dab in the middle of the season or, you know, a little bit later on in the season. So week nine, great bye week there. But yeah, everything after the bye, which the Steelers get Washington after the bye too. So we'll, we'll have that in common uh, is, and and I'm not the only one saying this. I, I think you'll agree, and a lot of media pundits have said the same thing. This is the worst eight uh eight week stretch it is that I have ever heard of ever in the like the history of the NFL. This is incredibly, incredibly difficult or nine week stretch, I should say, really. Um you get Washington after the bye, and then it's you got six division games, all AFC North, which you have all your six division games too, but I would argue the aggregate of Baltimore, Cleveland, oh, yeah. and Cincinnati, it's a tougher, it's much a tougher more division. difficult yeah. uh, grouping. And then you don't get any reprieve with the two non-division games because it's the Philadelphia Eagles who were you know Super Bowl contenders last year, Super Bowl uh, runners up the year before, and then the uh, Kansas City Chiefs who obviously are. Uh, reigning Super Bowl champions, but I'll walk through this schedule one by one, and we'll we'll work our way through it. But that stretch is just absolutely uh, brutal. So obviously, the hardest part for me is is figuring out what this team is even going to look like because I have no idea who's is Justin Fields going to be the quarterback? Is Russell Wilson going to be the quarterback? I'm going to operate under the assumption that Russell Wilson's the quarterback for the season. 
Uh, I do believe that at some point Justin Fields will be playing, but it's too hard to predict when that happens. And so I'm going to go with just the, uh, the the gut feeling that Russell Wilson, you know, starts the year uh, and and plays every game, even though I think Justin Fields will end up playing some time. And and I also am going to go with the assumption that their run game and overall offense is an improved one from the Matt Canada era because I trust in Arthur Smith. I think they've made upgrades to the offensive line. The only downside here is I don't know what their wide receiver room is going to look like. To me, Pittsburgh is going to need still to make some sort of move this offseason and make a trade because George Pickens and no one else is basically their wide receiver room right now. I think if you went back and you asked the GM Omar Khan if he envisioned this being the wide receiver room on May 24th uh, when he traded Deontay Johnson to the Carolina Panthers, I think he would tell you no. Uh, I think he would have assumed that they would have been able to get one of those free agents or had a, a trade done. Um, but that's the case right now. Roman Wilson, their rookie, is probably going to end up having to be the number two wide receiver, which doesn't you know, make you feel great because he wasn't a, a high pick. Um, but nonetheless, that's where we're at. And uh, an improved defensive unit, too. So I go into that. Uh, you know, with, with with that knowledge starting the season off. So week one at uh, the Atlanta Falcons, kind of a revenge game here for Arthur Smith. Feel comfortable about that. I think that's a win. They're in the dome. But at the end of the day, uh, Kirk Cousins is also, uh, you know, with a new unit, new team, new coaching staff. So I think that's a wash between the two teams. Russell Wilson, new uh, coordinator, new group to work with. So I think what it boils down to is roster, and I think the Steelers have a better roster. So they get the win on the road and a better coach here as well. So they, they get the win on the road. And then it's a road trip to Denver. Uh, look, it, it, this sucks. I would have loved for this to have been one of the home games. We knew going into it, it was going to be a road game. Road games in Denver, especially early in the season, are brutal because of that altitude. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna say this is a loss. As, as much as I think they have advantages across the board, it's – Back-to-back road games, it's, you know, Sean Payton. I know that, you know, Mike Tomlin does well against rookie quarterbacks. Um, I hope they win. Uh, I think it'll be a close game, but I'm going to give the edge to Denver just because of how brutal of a transition this is to play in the altitude at that point of the season. Uh, They should win, but I'm going to say this is going to be one of those games where I'm like, okay, if I'm trying to be realistic, I'll throw one of those wins I I, I think, you know, should be a loss. Um, and vice versa. So one and one going uh, at home against the Chargers. And uh, if this was a road game, I'd probably pick Chargers to win. I feel comfortable uh, at the home opener for the Steelers here. Would they be able to control the line of scrimmage? John Jim Harbaugh is a you know a ground and pound, win in the trenches kind of guy as well. So it's going to be kind of a a mashing of those two. But I think if you put our defensive line and offensive line up against theirs. I think ours wins out. Now they do have the better quarterback. That could obviously be uh, a big key deciding factor, but I'm going to give the edge here to Pittsburgh and make them two and one going in to another road matchup against the Colts. Uh, they lost this game last year. I'm going to give them a victory this time around. Mike Tomlin does really well against running quarterbacks. He's just really good at game planning against them. And so with Anthony Richardson really in his rookie year, given that he's only got what four games under his NFL belt? It was like four quarters under his belt. Or, yeah, it was, it was, uh, you're right. It was even less than that. It well, was like he got three hurt initially, by, and then he toughed it out, and then got hurt mid game. Uh, the, uh, the second game by by like week that. four, it was over. But it was I think yeah. he'd only played in like two and a half games. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. So really, he's not going to have much uh, experience to this point. And uh, I just feel confident that the Steelers defense is going to be able to handle that offense pretty well. We and both just get the Colts to- early, and I'm bo- and I'm and I'm thankful yeah. for that. I think we're both thankful for it. We don't want Anthony Richardson to feel comfortable. You don't want to play him by the time he's like rolling and feeling comfortable. Yeah, and you could argue that's the benefit against the Broncos early and the Falcons early too. Is that Kirk still getting his you know feet underneath him with this new team, even though he's an experienced yeah. quarterback? And then Denver, it's probably going to be Bo Nix. Like, that's a rookie making his second start of the year. Um, so that is the good thing is that, that they get some of these quarterbacks uh, and teams early in the season. And then they go home to Dallas. So this is a game that could go either way. They're 2-2 two and two at this point. Uh, I like Pittsburgh. I think they're a better 
I like Pittsburgh in this spot, I should say. I think they're a better unit, uh, and they're at home. But uh, I'm going to go back and give the Cowboys this game because it's just one of those games that, you know, the Steelers, you know, find a way to lose late. Uh, and, and I'm going to put them, you know, with their backs against the wall now at two and three going on the road to Vegas. I have them winning this game at Vegas. It's in a dome. Uh, they should begin their, you know, bearings underneath them now as a, you know, Arthur Smith and hopefully correcting the wrongs that have happened here early on in the, the year. And it's just an inferior opponent. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly fine saying that in Vegas. So we're 500 back home, taking on the Jets. Aaron Rodgers comes to town. I'm going to give us a win here in this one, uh, beating Aaron Rodgers. They have the better quarterback. We've got the better defense, I'd say, overall. Uh, way better offensive line, uh, better run game overall, too. They have the better running back. We have the better unit. Uh, and so I think this is a, a game that's, like, close. But the Steelers control the line of scrimmage, get a, a key turnover that wins them the game. And uh, one of those wins I'm going to give Pittsburgh that might be a loss but I've already given them a loss that maybe should have been a win. Uh, back home again for the only uh, situation where they've been back-to-back -back home games so far. The Giants take care of business there, too. I feel comfortable about that uh, with the Giants coming to town. You're back home for a second straight week. Feeling good. So now we are 4-3, and three, right, at this point, or 5-3, and, or five and three, I should say, at this point, uh, and uh, going into that bye week. So 5-3 and three seems like a pretty conservative and reasonable um situation for me then they go on the road to washington just like your bears after that week nine bye crucial to get a win here i mean this is a <laughs> you gotta win coming off the bye to not only uh put yourself again, in an inferior roster free spot but yeah i mean you need you need to be healthy and get this momentum going into this absolute brutal eight game stretch that you have ahead of you so i'm gonna give them the win here but I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit worried about that. That so six and three then Washington. So you have them at six, six and, and three, three, and then it's now it's now it's the brutal stretch. Can you find a way to ten wins? Right, and that's that's the tough part. Is I think you you would love to be able to go 500 during this stretch, and so to me, unfortunately, I feel because of this stretch. I feel the cap on the Steelers season is 10 wins. I feel the floor is eight, but then again, Mike Tomlin, never a losing season. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel that he's going to be eight, nine. So to me, nine and eight, 10 and seven is the, the, the room that I, I put him in here, but you know, the home game against, so you, you win it against Washington home game against Baltimore. Crucial to get a victory there Yeah, uh, because you only have, uh, three more home games the rest of the way, two of them against division opponents. You got to get this one against Baltimore. And to be fair, uh, since, since uh, Lamar Jackson has started games against the Steelers, he's one in seven against Pittsburgh. Yeah. So assuming he's healthy here, Pittsburgh has had Lamar Jackson's number. And so I'll give them the edge here. They go to seven and three on the road to Cleveland. Again, I, you know, this is a tough spot. Uh, I'm going to just have them going three and three in the division because I just think that's just how things normally shape up. And so um, I'll have them losing on the road to Cleveland in this one to go to seven and four. Uh, then it's on the road at Cincinnati. Are they going to lose two games in a row? I don't think so. I think they rebound and win on the road in a tough environment to go to eight and four. Then it's back home with the Browns. Here we go. We got our nine wins, nine and four uh, on the road at Philly. Uh, that's nine and five. I, I don't feel great about that game. Uh, that situation, Philly is likely also playing with everything to win or, or, or they have everything uh, to play for still. And the Steelers would be in the same position. And they just have a better roster than we do. So I'll give them the win. So what are we seven and or uh, nine and uh, five at this point, or was it nine and six? I lost track. Now you're nine, nine and, and six. Now nine and six. We'll, I'll give them a loss on the road at Baltimore. We're nine and seven. No, no, no. It was it was nine and five. So yeah, now now we lost at Baltimore is nine and um nine and six. Then we've got the final two games of the season, both at home. Thankfully, the Christmas Day game against the Chiefs, and uh, and then a, a final game against Cincinnati. 
So you're nine and six. Are you going to go zero and two and go nine and eight on the year, or can you split these final two games and get to ten and seven? That's the, that's the the yeah. whole hope here. To me, the the best chance. I just don't see them beating. Uh, you know, sweeping Cincinnati, especially with a healthy healthy Joe Burrow. So to me, the hope is that Kansas City has already locked up the one seed as of Christmas, or yeah. at least doesn't have everything to play for during Christmas and maybe sit some guys. Uh, and, and we pull out a rare win. Now the good the good thing I said, you know, final two games are home. So we'll hang our hat on that. I'll have them split this. I don't know which game it's gonna be. I'll say they went beat Kansas City only because Kansas City probably is sitting some guys at this point on a Wednesday um, and then losing to, to Cincinnati, the final game of the year, but 10 and seven, we both have our teams at 10 and seven of the year. Yeah. Um, but it's a tall order to go four and four in that final eight games. It's a really so I have tall a couple, order. So th- those I, first, however many games is absolutely crucial for the Steelers to at minimum to, to say six and three is a minimum is an understatement. That's that they yeah. have to be there. Well, and that's to me what's going to be so unique about this Steelers season. Now, I truly think this the Steelers are one of the three toughest teams in the NFL to predict for this year because we just have no idea what Russell will look like in Pittsburgh. And he's going to be tested early with a, a oh, yeah. giant emotional game for Arthur Smith on the road, right? And then a massively emotional game for him on the road and for Sean Payton, yeah, against Denver. So it is like if he is bad through those two starts, and if Pittsburgh somehow goes zero and two, and they don't look and he doesn't play well through the first two starts, they could easily quickly become like like red alert panic mode, right? Like, don't you think like if Pittsburgh's zero and two, and their offense. And and Russell Wilson has maybe thrown through two games, one touchdown, two interceptions, less than 400 yards passing, and is like completing less than you know like 60 percent of his throws. And and it's obvious he's not performing. Like it's panic mode, right? Like especially if Justin Fields looks good in preseason. There's so much that's interesting about Pittsburgh. Like I'm, yeah, I'm so glad. So many that things can happen. You, you're going to have such a fun. This can be such a fun season for us, for both of us, for different reasons. Because I think your team is one of the three hardest teams to predict. They're going to be every week is going to be like that roller coaster of the emotions. And for my team, it's the number one overall pick. It's you know, it's evaluating Caleb Williams, the future, and all that thing. Um, I truly believe when you look at the schedule, though, regardless of who's playing quarterback, you look at games like, to me, Denver's a must win. Indy's a must win. The Raiders is a must win. The Giants is a must win. Washington is a must win. Like, they have only five. Like, the Bears, how many did I list for? The Bears are like seven. Realistically, the Steelers only have like five games where I confidently can say, wait a minute. This team is better than this team. I don't care where they're playing or when it is. You have less games in that regard because I think we're both honest about it. Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Baltimore are all equal or better than in in the majority of the categories for the for compared to the Steelers, right? And then you're out of conference schedule. You add in Philadelphia, who is maybe the second best team or third best team in the NFC. And they're your in-state rival with a giant, giant emotional chip on the shoulder. And I don't consider Atlanta a must win or like a, because like, oh, that's an easy circle. That's an easy one because Atlanta's actually got a really solid roster and they have a quarterback in week one who I just don't know what I'm getting, but I have, but I say the same thing about Pittsburgh week one, no matter who's starting. So that one is one of those, You'd want to circle it, but I can't put it in the lock. You got to circle it, game. Um, yeah. So I, I got to be honest. When I first went through this before we went on the air, you know, and just got together, my initial like just going through it, win loss, win loss. I had Pittsburgh at eight and nine, and that was in my assumption. Justin Fields starting post buy. I think I think there's, I think that the it, Pittsburgh is not above five hundred going into the bye, 
then then that's real trouble for Russell Wilson. And I could see Pittsburgh oh, yeah. and Mike Tomlin knowing that post by they they can't they like they have to be more dynamic. They have to be better. They have to give their fans something. Um, but it also could save Justin just in the sense that maybe they are just at 500 and then you, then you, you know, you maybe win that game against Washington. You get blown out ugly at home against Baltimore. You give Russ one more game. He loses again. Then it's like, all right, now for the final six games, we're going to throw Justin in there. Maybe he's our savior. Maybe they save him knowing you might need that at the end of the season, just to hopefully keep your hopes alive going into that final stretch of the Bengals twice, the Eagles, the Chiefs, that really brutal, brutal schedule. So talk me through what you think. You you said you think Justin Fields is going to play. My guess is it will be after the bye or in that final stretch where it's like, good God, we need a spark. Um, we didn't win enough games to be comfortable going into this stretch. Now, now we're in Hail Mary mode. Yeah, I mean, I think you would preferably I would want him playing earlier than that because one game before that eight game slog doesn't seem like enough for me to, you know, inspire confidence to get Justin Fields rolling. I, I would prefer if, you know, it all depends, though, as you said, like on how Russell Wilson performs, if he's kind of just like hanging like what's in your there, leash, that's kind of what's prolonged. your leash with Russell. If you're uh, I mean, two my... and he's at fault, is it get him out? I, you know, it's, uh, it probably is because you're not paying him anything and you have a talented quarterback sitting behind him that can do things within the system that I think work really well. I mean, I think Justin Fields is kind of tailor made for an Arthur Smith type offense, heavy play action. Yeah. Uh, big, big time throws down the field and using that athleticism, you know, uh, in the backfield. So I would say it's a fairly short leash for Russell. So yeah, if they go own two and it's because of him, then I would say chargers at home or, you know, Colts on the road, give yeah. Justin Fields some, a shot in the dome there. But I just don't like after the buy Justin Fields, then all of a sudden starts playing yeah. at Washington gets the one game sample size under his belt. And Oh, by the way, Okay, now get ready to play Baltimore's defense, yeah. Cleveland's defense, yeah. Cincinnati's defense, Cleveland again, Philly. Like that's it's brutal. brutal to like get any any but sort of confidence do, going. Yeah, know? it's true. It's true. So maybe best yeah. case, like, but you can't afford. It's it's hard because then you're saying you can't afford to start zero and two. Like you've got to find no, a way yeah. to at least be one and one with those games. So sure. I think the key, in my opinion, the key for for ball, for Pittsburgh is going to be offensively how do you play if you're if you're owing two but russ is playing good football and it's like hey we scored 24 points against atlanta and lost and we scored yeah. 27 points against stuff, denver or... and lost and yeah. we're running the ball and I, and I haven't thrown a backbreaking you know what i mean like don't blame me if it's if it's a defense or something else but if it's if it's the offense goes to atlanta only scores 10 and then goes to denver only scores 13 in losing efforts the one thing Justin Fields will be, no matter what, with his bad, bad plays and horrible mistakes, he's instant offense. And he's just gonna, dynamic. He's yeah. going to go out there, and you're going to at least have a chance for your offense to move the football, whether it's a giant throw or it's a giant run. So it's going to be fascinating. I can't wait. Then there's – um, I know you have a, a, a stat to move yeah. that you want to move on to. I think it's really fascinating. Do you mind if I talk about – one team in particular here really quickly before you jump into it. Sure thing. Of course. Let's so I, I wanted to touch on one of the things I think is really interesting right now is there's a lot of a talk and discussion. Like, you know, you're trying to find those storylines like, Oh, what's going on? Who can we talk about? It's the off season, the NFL. I think the Miami dolphins are a really fascinating team, right? Playoff team last year. It's everyone saying you got to pay Tua. I think Miami would be so smart. So, so smart to do the Joe Flacco um, Baltimore Ravens thing. Don't pay him. You can't pay him. And if the worst thing that happens is he he leads you to a Super Bowl or an AFC title game, and then you have to pay him after the season maybe more because it's like, hey, he won you all these games. Well, I'd rather sign up for that 
then pay him big now before the season starts. Because yeah. that Jared Goff contract, it reset the market for those guys, right? If you're sure. paying Jared Goff now $50 million, okay, and we both agree, I think, Jared Goff is the best of those other guys, the Tua's, the Derek Carr's, the Dak Prescott's, the Kirk Cousins. I think we agree Jared Goff is like the leader of that group, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pay one of those guys who we think is worse than Goff more than 50, even if it's 50.5, right? You got to get him above Goff. The, it's a, it could end up being an absolute disaster for Je for Miami because the schedule is really not workable. And it's not a great, great schedule for Miami because you start at home against Jacksonville. No advantage of weather, right? And a Jacksonville team that is absolutely in prove-it mode. You then get the Bills at home. You think, oh, early September, advantage of weather. Well, it's prime on Thursday night. So the no no blaring down sun, anything like that to be an advantage for you in that. Then you go on the road to Seattle. That is the longest road trip possible within the continental United States, Miami to Seattle. You come back home for some winnable games against the Titans and and Patri uh, Titans, and then you're on the road against the Patriots at home against the Colts. So workable. But then the season ends. Jets, Texans, Niners, Browns, Jets. Well, actually, it ends Packers, Jets, Texans, Niners, Browns, Jets. So the worst thing you can do for your franchise, for the health of it, the health of your fan base and everything, is pay a guy big money and then the season doesn't go the way you want it to go. Because that's what happened with Kyler Murray, right? You paid him the big money and then it was shaky, then he got injured. And it's yeah. like, and now ever since then, it's been, should we draft a guy? Do we even believe in Kyler? It's a little different. You paid Joe Burrow giant money and then he got injured, but you'd already seen Joe Burrow play in a Super Bowl. That's why he got paid the big money. Two, all we've seen from him so far is, okay, last year he didn't get concussed and he got embarrassed on the road in a playoff game. Like that's, that's what you've seen. And now you're going to pay him, 50 more than 50 million dollars and then you have that type of year where I could easily convince you to go through game by game that Miami would be really lucky to find their way to to 10 11 wins and then you're stuck with 50 million dollars it's different in the NFC Jared Goff in the NFC with that roster 50 million when everyone's already locked up and paid you already paid your wide receiver it's not like they have to pay anyone else for a couple of years and the guarantees for Jared are way lower. He's not in that top five guarantee. You're not paying him $200 million guaranteed like Joe Burrow, like Patrick Mahomes, like Deshaun Watson. It's a very different contract. So yeah. I'm, I I just think that that, that Miami is, is fascinating to watch as far as how they handle the Tua situation. If I was Miami, I'd be very blatant with him. I would tell them, I would tell his agent every day, watch the Joe Flacco, go back and look at Joe Flacco when they won the Super Bowl with the Ravens. That's what we're hoping for from your client. We want your client to win us the Super Bowl, and then we'll pay him any amount. He'll pay him $60 million a year. We don't care. doesn't matter then. doesn't matter what you pay him if he wins the Super Bowl. Yeah. Well, that's what we need from your client to get him to the desired money he wants. And you know what? Then we'll give him even more money than he wants. But if he can't do that this year, well, then we'll have some really tough contract talks next year if we even talk contract at all. And if your client wants to hold out, be our guest. I feel we have the AFC's version of Kyle Shanahan as our head coach, and we'll just go get a guy off the street, and I think we'll be fine. So I really do believe Miami is in a – they have to stay strong right now. That schedule is tougher than it looks, and you, you've got to got to stay strong. You cannot pay two of $50 million before he wins you something. If he gets to a Super Bowl this year, even if he gets – he doesn't have to win it. If he gets to the Super Bowl, if he makes it through Burrow – through Allen, through Lamar, through Mahomes, through uh, Watson, through uh, you know uh, C.J. Stroud. If he does that, then fine, pay him. You know what I mean? But sure. we've yeah. got to yeah. see him do something. Yeah, yeah, you just can't do it. And yeah. it's the same. I'd argue the same thing. It. I'd argue the same thing with the Cowboys and Dak, and with Green Bay and Jordan Love. Green Bay's mm -hmm. roster is set for any quarterback to come in there, and they have an offensive coach. I like Jordan Love. We said Jordan Love played really well at the end of the year. He impressed us both. But it's the same thing. I would tell him, watch that Joe Flacco and Ravens tape. 
We would love to pay your client what he's asking for. We'll talk again after we win the Super Bowl next year. Make sure your client's a big yeah. part of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to see who the main quarterbacks uh, of free agency will be next year. Who's going to be the Kirk Cousins, the Derek Carr, the Aaron yeah. Rodgers, or Russell Wilson? I'll look that up I think real it's quick probably Dak. This stat. Yeah, uh, I, it yeah. probably is. I, I think it's probably Dak, and, and you. what, what if uh, Miami, you insert Dak into Miami's offense? Do they get worse? I don't think so. I think they probably get a little bit better even. No, but I don't know you're, what you're going to have to pay Dak on the open market is what you'd have to pay two sure. anyways, and then it's like. Yeah, but it would be a shorter-term deal most likely. You wouldn't have to pay. Quarterbacks who are slated term, to but... hit the market include Trevor Lawrence. Now, they could pick up his fifth-year option. He won't hit the market, yeah. There's... Jordan Love, Tua. J well, now, and Goff just got signed, so this is old. This was back in eight, early April. So Jordan Love, Tua, and Dak, the three guys just talked about. So again, yeah, yeah. ride it out. And I know next year's quarterback class isn't great, so that helps to uh, Dak and Jordan Love. Right. But if I were those three guys too, I would all be trying to get paid now because I think all three of them have tough schedules this year. It's not going to be as easy for them. Right. So they're yeah, going to no. push to try to get paid. But if you're those teams, stay strong. Stay strong. I love uh, Warren Sharp's uh, analysis when he comes to, when it comes down to the NFL schedules and NFL teams. Like he does such a good job of He's great laying out his entire no emotion. Uh, yeah, and it's all it's all based on um, analytics and and different uh, just unique ways of measuring the success. And I think things that really do matter. Um, so in referencing what he does over at sharpfootballanalysis.com it's great great stuff and it's you know most of it is free to view uh according to him based on multiple factors including uh obviously projected win totals but strength of schedule uh rest advantages these are the five teams with the easiest schedules this upcoming year number 1 the Atlanta Falcons number 2 the Los Angeles Chargers number 3 your Chicago Bears yeah Number four, the New York Jets, and number five, the New Orleans Saints. The five hardest schedules in 2024, number one, my Pittsburgh Steelers, number two, the New England Patriots, number three, the Cleveland Browns, number four, the Baltimore Ravens, and number five, the Minnesota Vikings. Now, obviously, this is just one facet of you know, evaluating how an NFL team does. And that's why I'm going to share another thing that Warren Sharp pulls together. This is a really interesting thing that, you know, hasn't uh, been studied as far as I know, outside of Warren Sharp. Now he's, he's done studies dating back to 1990 on these. He hasn't been doing it since 1990, but he's evaluated schedules uh, dating back to 1990 about rest advantages. And this is, to, to lay it out there very simply, if you are a team playing on Monday night and your opponent played on Sunday, the following the, your opponent for the following week played on Sunday, your opponent gets that Monday to prepare while you're playing another team, right? So that's one extra day of prep work that your your opponent rest has advantage has yeah. over you. So it's a plus one d uh, advantage then for your opponent and a minus one or uh, disadvantage for you that following week. He has compiled the total net advantage days yeah. and disadvantage days for every team this season. And he is he has the Baltimore Ravens. Now, mind you, they had the fifth or fourth hardest schedule, but they have a plus 16 net number wow. of days advantage That's over crazy. their opponents throughout the year. So they're, they have 16 days of rest. Compared so to their so overall, opponent basically, to year. think about that in and it's you know in, in the simplest terms, they're playing a lot of Sunday games versus teams that are playing a lot of Monday games. Yeah, so like and next, or, you know, or they play they on Thursday, and then they don't play. They're playing it. You know what I mean? Like they're getting. It's crazy. It, it it's it's an incredible, incredible way to look at it because the Ravens, yeah, while they have a really tough schedule, they're always going to have more time to prepare for the next opponent than the, whoever they're playing. Exactly. Yep. And with a and good coach like a Harbaugh and a good quarterback like a Lamar, that's huge. 
exactly and it's and it's not so much as you could see on this chart here on youtube it's fantastic but go over to sharpfootballanalysis.com and check it out because it's really cool to look at he's got all 32 teams in here uh he was saying based on his data dating back to 1990 a plus 16 net rest at edge is by far the largest rest advantage uh, wow. in the last 34 years that any team has ever had and he suspects given that there were 14 game seasons prior to that and just how the NFL ever worked that it's it's the largest rest edge advantage and so we don't it's know crazy. how that's going to help play out we just don't it's statistical yeah. anomaly a little bit it is it is now and San Fran last year now mind you they were super you know successful team had Brock Purdy do his thing last year San Fran had the uh largest disadvantage they also have the largest disadvantage this so it didn't matter didn't impact them last year right and they are minus 21 uh minus where are my bears days. at and and you could see there's <laughs> like all of these red blocks are each individual week so there are three games where they are at a minus seven day advantage meaning that they have to play a team coming off of a buy three different occasions wow. that's brutal that's tough and then on another three games they have a three game disadvantage which is either them coming off of or, or going into a thursday night game uh and and not having a bye the week before or whatever you know, it might on be on a wednesday or you know just all weird stuff so that's brutal because you could see the reason for baltimore's advantage isn't because of all the pluses although obviously they're there it's that they only have a minus one day disadvantage twice the rest of the year it's either a wash or they're in the plus column so San Fran is in the minus almost all of the year. They only have an advantage twice. So, where are my bears just, at? Your bears are at a plus five. They are at a respectable right. plus five, which I'll probably take that. also helped play into their strength of schedule and all of that stuff. Um, they're a disadvantage by three games twice, but that's it. Otherwise, it's minus one. And then they have a plus seven with the buy, and they have a plus three day advantage twice throughout the year so everyone should get a plus seven unless you're playing yeah. also someone coming off of a buy right correct and i don't think that that's the case really at all i think i think everyone well okay uh here for tampa bay they have a plus four so perhaps their buy the team played a thursday night or something the, like the, that the, yeah. the week before so they yeah. they get they Only get extra four. three days right so that was that's probably what that is um, it looks like Indy. Wow, Indy only has a plus one, and that's it for the year. So they must also what about, be playing a team coming off a of bye. What about Washington? Because um, Washington's playing the Bears. The Bears or Washington gets them like they take the Bears, get Washington after their bye, and the Steelers get Washington after their bye. Yeah, so that must be the minus seven and the minus six here for Washington. Yeah. Um, but then Washington big. gets a plus seven, so they're playing a team off of their the, 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 Washington's. Okay you know playing a they team get it back a a bye, whereas that that other team is not you know having a, a, a buy yeah. the week before and so, i think yeah, this is for 95 percent of the league they all get at least one plus seven advantage some in, are plus six some are plus eight but it's that, really funny because week to week it does matter it feels like it matters for your team when you're like crap we're playing the team now we're down but I've yeah. never thought of it as the whole total of the season. Yeah, me neither. I yeah, but I didn't you know do this existed. When you I think about that, you fire. think about it like overall, Baltimore should consistently always have a health advantage too over their opponent because they have your the the rest advantage also is a health advantage, right? Because it would be we have extra literal not only like phys we have physical rest but a mental preparation edge. So it's like my team's got more time to mentally prepare for your team, but also my body should be more rested almost going into every game. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's crazy. That's cool. And, Sharp is the and, best. Uh, he noted that the, the swing between plus, the Ravens plus 16 and the 49ers minus 21 uh, is the worst differential between the best. So and we'll worst. see if, the, um, if, if it yeah. didn't impact San Francisco last year, but you know, who knows? It could play catch up on it here now that you're constantly playing uh, with a little less rest and a little less time to prepare. 37% of all the games being played this year will feature at a, a game in which 
at least one of the teams has a rest advantage over their opponent. That's so the most a, in NFL history. Now it's only 37%. That doesn't sound like a lot, yeah. but that's 101 games where yeah. one of Think the about teams it. has an advantage there. In a game, in a weekend, in a weekend, that's about like four games. We can literally point out where you're yeah. like, oh, okay, four of these games, that, that team's got a, a legitimate advantage. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and that's yeah, only going to get wilder really because it's only going to get wilder because the NFL is now doing the Wednesday game and, and Christmas. Like they're doing that yeah. Friday game in Sao Paulo. They're, they're willing now to just take over the schedule. So the NFL is, I think, saying, listen, we're trying to make it as fair as possible, but also we're an entertainment product and we just don't care. Yeah. It's always going to be the, the entertainment value in the dollar ahead of, you know, what's good for the specific good teams. for the players yeah and yeah and i mean obviously roger goodell lately has like really come out and, and forecasted that they are going to do an 18 game season it's oh it's inevitable a, it's got to wait for the um, cba it'll happen and so with the second bye week likely inserted in there i wonder how that how that They'll plays hopefully be able these, to fair it, make it more fair yeah. at that point you're going to equal it or out. will they not be paying a, enough attention to it and will there be a team like the ravens <laughs> who get a plus 28 you know, well you got it then, uh, then warren advantage. sharp's got to go knock on the nfl office like all right we got you got to do something here yeah 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 get uh get them on board and and help uh weed weed this out a little bit but no that was a fun exercise um Really liked that. Is there any one particular primetime game? I know we didn't really like delve into the entirety of the NFL schedule or anything, but was there like one primetime game that you were like, oh, you know, that's that's one that I'm really excited for uh, this year? Well, I, I mean, I'm really excited to get a chance for the Bears to be back on Thanksgiving. I think Bears yeah, Lions cool. Thanksgiving is like one of my favorite things when it happens every year. Um, and so that I love that the Bears playing on Thanksgiving. I also, um, I think, I mean, I'm really excited for Jets, Eagles, Sao Paulo, Brazil Friday night because that's mm. that that's the type of game where obviously the Eagles are another team that has so much at stake this year and they need to get off to a hot start because they were the worst team in the league last year at the end of the season and they ended up in the playoffs just because they'd won so many games early. But Nick Sirianni coaching for his job, they had Saquon Barkley and some other big, uh, big time signings, and so you say to yourself, "This is a team now that's got to get that mojo back going," and um, and they started in Brazil against Aaron Rodgers. We just don't have no idea what to expect from Aaron. I mean, sorry, against Green Bay, a, a team that was extremely, extremely hot to end the year, and 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 again, a quarterback who's going to be playing for a big contract. So I love that. I can't wait for that, and that's going to be. Um, it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun, I think, to to watch it and see the production value of it, and and uh, you know we get the NFL in Europe, but the NFL in South America, like that's a what the fan cool. reaction will be like. It'll be very interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to Week 17 Monday Night Football Lions at San Francisco 49ers, a rematch oh, that's week 17. there. Like that's gonna and it's Week 17. Like that's gonna Ooh, be juicy yeah, last Monday very Night Football epic game matchup, and it's going to matter a lot like we it know is. it's going to matter a lot that Are could they, be the one they're seed. competing for the one seed yeah they, yeah. they very oh well good call be. um good call a lot on the line there so i think that's pretty epic uh, monday night football to watch out there but that has been our recap of the nfl schedule release hope you all enjoyed it appreciate you sticking with us every week throughout the year and uh these past four years been wild so we'll continue to roll with OTAs and then training camp around the corner and all of that fun stuff to come uh, in the coming weeks. But as always, you can find us over at, at FB Lounge Pod, anywhere you get your social media. Check us out at forfantasysakeqc.com, all of the other great shows on the Four Frequency Sake Podcast Network. But that'll do it for us here today. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.